Thank you, Madam, uh, and uh, good morning again. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I uh, was uh, happy to uh, select this topic, antimicrobial resistance. In a day and age when we are dealing with uh, uh, another infection that is ravaging our country. Um, so I start off with this uh, quotation by the great physician, William Osler, who we consider as father of professional me medical professionalism. He said, humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. Of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible is fever. And I suppose that's self-explanatory in a day and age when we are uh, fighting a battle which is more uh, grave than uh, the Elam war that we, and the uh, insurrections that we have endured in our country in this last century. This is a picture that I saw a couple of days back from uh, social media. The credibility, I'm not too sure uh, whether it is a crop, uh, uh, photoshopped um, image or not, but the message I think is clear. You see that it's a Petri dish of a culture uh, from 1991 in comparison to a culture in 2021. And you see, you see visually, uh, you realize that there is definitely a problem of antimicrobial resistance. A little bit from the history. So the first antimicrobial agent was a drug called Salvasan, which was uh, used for an important disease called syphilis, which we rarely see now. Um, and there, from then onwards, this concept of chemotherapy or use of antimicrobials came into the medicine. And it was in 1927 by an accident that uh, Sir Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And it changed the whole uh, scope of human history and helped in winning the last great war of the uh, last century. And you see, this is the story of the antimicrobial uh, uh, history. You see that in 1929, Fleming publishes his first paper on penicillin. And then th thereafter, in the next several decades, more and more antibiotics come into the uh, scenario. And then within 20 years of uh, detecting a uh, diag uh, of uh, discovering penicillin, you see that penicillin resistance uh, staph aureus strains are detected and they are declared as a global pandemic. And it was in 2001 that the WHO stated that the, there's a global public health concern. But 10 million antimicrobial uh, resistant related deaths still occur as of now each year. But when we go retrospect, it was in 1945 that Fleming, uh, while receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine, uh, warns of the penicillin resistance. And I take you back to this. The thoughtless person playing with penicillin treatment is morally responsible for the death of man who succumbs to infection with penicillin resistant organism. What an important statement that is. So therefore you see that there, there, this serious threat is no longer a prediction, uh, but uh, it is actually happening right now. Uh, every region put, and it is, yeah, every person is potential to be affected by it in this, in our, even in our country. And you see that the annual mortal rate is 700,000 at present globally. And by 2050, the cost will rise with 10 million lives at stake and trillions of uh, dollars going into waste. So this is something that we have to understand. You see that from 1930s, there was a, a, a steep rise of development of antimicrobials. And then by the time that we were born, uh, that it was coming to almost like a, a downslope. And then since 1990, onwards that there is a discovery void. We see that there is ha hardly new antimicrobials coming into the, the, uh, the armamentarium. So what are the reasons for this void? So 
most of it's it's because of scientific reasons most of the known drug targets are already being ex exploited and explored so there is nothing more that we can uh, deal with that of course medicine is now changing into a different field where biologics are coming into treatment also the commercial value the, the, the reason being that uh, agents have limited prospects for profit by pharmaceutical companies and ph companies that develop this because antimicrobials are only used for short duration you give the antibiotic cup maybe couple of days or weeks and the patient recovers and the and there is always a cure for the target disease and there is uh, when there is resistant developing the, the demand for that particular drug uh, declines so therefore there is uh, inertia in the commercial uh, pharmaceutical arena to develop more and more drugs and you see th th there is like a diagram uh, underneath see that for every uh, 10000 compounds as time goes on it takes about uh, close upon uh, seven to eight years for a drug development and you see that it's only one drug that comes for 10,000 drugs and there are so many regulatory bottlenecks uh, which require a lot of uh, demanding so what are our concerns well we as clinicians or doctors uh, we have uh, treatment problems of treatment failure which goes on to increase mortality and uh, there is a significant communal spread. There's also a low resistance of uh, low level of resistance going on in the community, which we do not see. It's like seeing only the only the uh, uh, tip of the iceberg. Of course, there's additional burden to the healthcare costs. We see that so, so much of money at the moment is spent on healthcare needs of these people who are infected. So you see. We do not project ourselves to the problem of antimicrobial resistance because it's, it has been in our system for long years. And there is also a threat, threat to return back to the pre-antibiotic era, more so the era when, uh, when before the Second World War. So what are the reasons for antimicrobial resistance? So first and foremost, the concept of self-medication. We, we tend to have Count, over the counter medication without prescriptions. Sometimes we even tell our patients, okay, when you have sore throat, I'll go, go and get this drug, that drug, etc. And you see that a study done in 2018, much, not much of studies have been done in Sri Lanka regarding this, but a study done by Zawahir uh, showed that 61% pharmacies dispense over the counter antibiotics in Sri Lanka, which is actually a very, very bad indicator of. Uh, which surrogate indicator of uh, leading to antimicrobial resistance. And their lack of knowledge on dangerous effects of mistreating is also another reason. So we, our, one of our duties should be to educate our patients not to take the unnecessary drugs. Clinical misuse, this is our problem. We inappropriately uh, give antibiotics to people who do not need antibiotics for viral illnesses. Sometimes we just, uh, because of the fact that there is some sort of a sepsis going on, uh, which we think it may be sepsis, we just give the highest possible antibiotic empirically without any rational thought. So, and also the pharmaceutical um, sales promotions and various cohesive uh, uh, campaigns that are uh, taken and that take place uh, in uh, the hospitals as well as our car parks and majority of uh, prescribers do not uh, realize the uh, their ha prescribing habits they think okay the sa same antibiotics that I, we that we have been writing when we just come out of medical school may be given or the rest of uh, the uh, 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 clinical practice. So these will all lead into clinical misuse. So it is every time that antibiotics are prescribed, it, we need to make sure that we take satisfactory cultures when we are dealing with uh, uh, clinical problems which do not have uh, a sort of a etiological agent and we need to make sure that the indication the dose the drugs the duration all of these are 
align with it. And we need to revisit and reassess at the, at the end of 48 hours to see whether our treatment is doing good or bad for the patient. Another reason is a counterfeit drug. So much so we say that generic drugs uh, prescription is, is the rational way of uh, prescribing. We see that there are so many counterfeit drugs where there, there, there may be wrong active compounds or lower concentration of the active in ingredients or the mere fact that they may be expired drug because the cold chain has not been maintained or because the proper good pharmaceutical practice, manufacturing practices have not been uh, uh, followed. So these also lead into sub-therapeutic, sub-inhibitory uh, antibiotic concentrations. Industries, we see that there are so many uh, pharmaceutical companies that are coming up things in bulk and they dispose the waste, antimicrobial waste directly into water causing exposure of these antimicrobial agents in large amounts uh, to uh, other species, animals, as well as the residents of uh, the areas where these factories are set up. Of course, various health system factors also take place, improper diagnosis, inadequate lab services. We are misguided by our own notions and our misjudgments. There's also a concept of overdiagnosis and overprescription. And these intense use uh, for prolonged periods and multiple and the use of multiple antibiotics will all lead to AMR. So how dare we do this? We, we, uh, we as I mentioned, the pharmaceutical companies as well as hospital clinics, we disposed, uh, disposed uh, clinical material or unused or expired medication in a irrational way. This leads into AMR. Overcrowding, poor infection control, need, not needless to say, yes. And also if we may know, not know, antimicrobials are used in food industry, especially animal husbandry and ag agriculture, aquaculture, where they are used as agents to improve the growth, to prevent infections. So you, you exposed, other species, other animals into this and they transmit the resistance strains to us. So therefore we have this thing about this one health concept, the humans, the animal health, as well as the environment, all are one continuum. So in uh, February this year, the WHO uh, uh, released a list of antibiotic resistant pri priority pathogens. They listed as pri priority one, two, three as critical, intermediate, and low. So in the first priority, they, these organisms, which are super, super bugs like Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas, and Enterobacteriaceae, which are all resistance to these high agents like carbapenems, as well as the third generation cephalosporins are listed out. The, the intermediate or high, high uh, group uh, composed of organisms which we, which we are usually coming across our clinical practice in outpatient departments. Staph aureus, skin sepsis, Helicobacter pylori. We don't think about it when we think about gas management of uh, peptic ulcer disease. Campylobacter salmonella, which are uh, causative agents of gastroenteritis. And then you see the Neisseria gonorrhea. So all these are also falling into the intermediate high category where you see that vancomycin, drugs like vancomycin, uh, clarithromycin, and the quinolones are all at uh, resistant levels. And the medium level is for things like strep pneumonia, uh, hemophilus, which both of these causes uh, new, uh, pneumonia of uh, the respiratory tract, as well as uh, dysentery, like with Shigella. So, in, when we talk about the antimicrobial resistance in Sri Lanka, almost all Acinetobacter, we have a huge problem of this Acinetobacter uh, infections in our ICU setups, as well as coliforms uh, in, because of ventilator associated transmission. And these are multi-drug resistant organisms. And all these coliforms, some of them 
uh, are resistant to third generation cephalosporins. This was a study done in 2015. We don't have published data ever since then, much, much uh, pursued. And in 2013, uh, the College of Microbiology said that 30% of typhoid uh, and paratyphoid uh, illnesses are resist were resistant to ciprofloxacin. So there is a model what we can do. Uh, we can prioritize the way that we, can, uh, we give our antibiotics to our patients. So uh, that brings the access of the right antibiotic, right agent to the right place and at right times, the rational prescription and to con conserve effectiveness of the last uh, resort agent when we don't have anything in our armamentarium. So, these are what these are the drugs in the essential medicine list, which are available generally to uh, satisfy the priority needs of all population. You see that we see drugs like ampicillin, amoxicillin. We don't use those two drugs now much. We we are inclined to use drugs like oamoxiclav, and there we see that there are other drugs, the cephalosporins, the cephalexin. Uh, also, cloxacillin. We have a tendency from to moving from cloxacillin to flucloxacillin in, in our prescription. Of course, in certain uh, situations, in the agents that I have highlight, I have depicted in bold letters, they are rationalized for certain uh, severe infections in uh, the as a primary mode of treatment, and therefore it is listed as access. Then. We need to watch when we do think about prescribing these drugs. When we, if we are thinking or if we are inclined to prescribe these drugs, for instance, the drugs like quinolone, ciprofloxacin, cip levofloxacin, uh, third generation cephalosporins like kefixim, keftraxone, kefotaxim, keftazidine, all the T drugs, I would say, and uh, the macrolides and gly glycopeptides like vancomycin. Piperacillin, Tazobactam, the antisudomonas, and the uh, drugs which we liberally prescribe, meropenem, impenem, etc. We have to have a second thought of prescribing this. And we need to reserve these drugs, the fourth generation cephalosporins, which are coming into the market, uh, which are in the market, but are gaining mo mo momentum, kefepim, and the fifth generation cephalosporin, keftralin and other drugs like polymyxine, cholestine, which are very toxic, and also drugs like linazolid and uh, daptomycin, which are used in ICU setups. So we need to question ourselves. If, we, if there is a possibility, always we need to uh, always have a joint meeting with our own colleagues, our doctors. You may be a consultant, you, or you may be a senior person in your ward, you need to always think about okay, opening your ears to the uh, to, uh, the thoughts that your juniors may be giving. There's no card of a clinical pharmacist in Sri Lanka as, as yet, but if you work in the West, you see that always the pharmacist will uh, will ask the doctor. Okay, that is sort of like a bottle. We may think that it's a bottleneck, but it's always a system check to see whether we are irrationally prescribing antibiotics. So I think that is something that uh, can be used. So we have these national guidelines uh, you know, uh, uh, published by the College of Microbiologists in 2016. I hope you have a, a copy of this. If not, this is available as a PDF copy. This is a guideline and that will, that will provide some insight as to what should be started as an empirical treatment for our patients in e each and every clinical uh, setting. It's a very important, very useful guidelines. But they cannot give definitive gui uh, recommendations. So we, they are always useful if you if somebody is in the very deep periphery, when there is no diagnostics available or there is no uh, 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 senior uh, consultant uh, coverage, where you can go for an empirical selection till as a form of life saving for the patient. And then definitive management, as I mentioned, after commencing on the antibiotics should be revisited at 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, and should be de dependent on the antibiotic sensitivity and the clinical acumen of the team. 
would like to go through a few of the superbugs that we are dealing with at the moment. So MRSA, we see it more commonly in our wards. It sort of, it has become uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it has become like a crow. So you see that it is, an, it is a variant of Staph aureus where there is a uh, effect on the penicillin binding proteins uh, causing uh, 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 resistance to break down of the beta lactam ring. And it has become a commensal or a pathobiont as, as I mentioned. And there are uncomplicated infections. You and I, we may be, we, we are most likely carrying this because of our clinical exposure. We take it to our homes, we get, give it to other patients. So it is a common cell. And it can give rise to uncomplicated infections, usually with uh, skin sepsis or with intravenous catheters or devices. But you see that some of them can disseminate to the bones, the joints, and the valves can and cause very deleterious effects. So risk factors include people, those who have low immunity, including diabetics in, uh, and people who abuse uh, intravenous drugs and patients who have uh, severe, uh, significant respiratory diseases like COPD. So the treatment, what is advocated is intravenous vanc vancomycin. Guidelines, uh, international guidelines pre always prescribe to use uh, pre-level vancomycin levels uh, before giving the next day's drug. But we don't have this facility in our setup. But at least if we can do renal functions to see whether there is uh, any abnormality where we have to account for the uh, dosage of the vancomycin, that could be uh, very beneficial to our patients. So minimum of two weeks is given for intravenous uh, vancomycin. And if there are complicated infections like deep-seated infections, we, we think about giving drugs, uh, add, adding second agent drugs like fusidic acid, rifampicin, gentamicin, and cipro. Linozolid is an effective agent. The, the, the benefit of this is this is an oral preparation. So it is useful in the management of community-acquired MRSA as well as the hospital-acquired MRSA but it comes with a price of uh, myelosuppression causing peripheral neuropathy as well as optic neuropathy. So this can be used for MRSA pneumonia uh, and also for skin sepsis. So, but if severe infections are there, then we need to think about giving vancomycin uh, or even if we, in the West, this fifth generation cephalosporin uh, is now used. Along with treatment with MRSA, we need to decolonize patients where we have to uh, in, uh, always instruct our nursing staff as well as the, our supportive staff on the importance of daily baths with chlorexidine and also about the chlorexidine shampoos on alternative days. Mupirocin, nasal ointment, uh, uh, usually we, uh, the microbiologists tell to apply a match head size proportion three times a day and uh, also uh, application of mupirocin to skin lesions. And these knee patients need to be screened after five days. Visa or vancomycin intermediate resistance strain of uh, Staph aureus is a new strain of MRSA that is now shown to be resistant to vancomycin and ticoplan. So the armamentarium that we have for that is this drug called linazolid. And also these very toxic, expensive drugs like Pinopristine, dalfopristine, and uh, the, the fifth generation uh, cephalosporins like keftaroline and drugs like daptomycin and tigacycline. VRE is also another emerging bug where it, co it causes uh, uh, problems in the uro uh, urological system as well as in biliary, as biliary sepsis. Again, uh, linozolid, daptomycin, and tigacycline can be used. Carbapenem resistance pseudomonas uh, is, uh, 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 it can come as monoresistant strains to drugs such as cipro, uh, gentamicin, keftazidine, piperacillin, tazobacter, or it, they can manifest as multidrug resistant strain uh, where uh, there is even cholestine, which is, the, which is a toxic drug and it's the end drug that we usually reserve for 
um, multi-resistant organisms where it may not be effective at all. Acinator biomany, acinator bacter biomany is something that we have very much seen in our ICU setups because of ventilators. Uh, it's opportunistic pathogen. It's it's not a pathogen usually that will cause a simple infections, but in people who have low immunity, for people who are critically ill, septic in new ICUs like pneumonia, tracheostomies, people who have meningitis, various wounds, especially uh, war, uh, war uh, results, war, war uh, injuries uh, uh, can also uh, give rise to acinator bioma infections. And this was called the Iraqi bacter because of its association with the Gulf War. ESBL is an important uh, agent that we see in our uh, ventricle wards where beta most beta lactams are in, in, involved, including E. coli and Tepsiella pneumonia. Urosepsis, biliary sepsis, and GI sepsis are usual manifestations, and we are always inclined to start these patients on meropenem, eltapenem, which is a once a day drug, and even amikacin. So, another important thing that is coming from our neighboring country, which we are at a threat, which, which is maybe, which already we may be having in our community, but we do not see is this thing called carbapenem resistant enterobacteria. Especially this New Delhi metalloprotein, a metallobeta lactamase uh, strain, NDM strain, uh, New Delhi strain, which, we are, we, which is uh, rampant in India. Just, we are talking about our lambda strain, del delta strain, et cetera, but this may be already going in, uh, in uh, unprecedented nature, nature. So these are all these. So we need to think about antimicrobial agents to ship in all this. We need to have a joint discussion. It's not only a single uh, uh, headed decision where the consultant would give the decision, but a joint decision with the juniors as well as we need to get insight from the microbiologists clinical microbiologists on how to optimize our patients and also think about utilizing this new card that comes up with clinical pharmacists who would give us uh, 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 insight regarding our practices. So this, I end with a few other uh, messages. This is a picture that I used to see in the staff toilet when I used to work at Cambridge University Hospitals. Every time we used to sit on the toilet seat, the commode, this picture was there at the door. So please clean your hands. We do not want unwelcome visitors. Very appropriate in our setting these days. We need the importance of hand washing. And I come back to Osler who said, soap and water are the, and common sense are the best disinfectants. And we need to practice this. We make it a part of our, uh, our practice day by day, every day, in every moment, not only these five moments in uh, hand washing. And I thank the, uh, you for listening to this lecture. And I hope that, that we may be able to refrain from making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance of the same disease. Thank you.